So, I mean, you've been, you're kind of legendary in, in Nashville for playing all these sessions. Can you tell a little bit about how you got into the, that, uh, doing that, that gig? In the session gig? Yeah. Uh, well, I, first of all, I knew a couple players here. You always got, you know, if you're not in Nashville and somewhere out in the United States somewhere and wanting to get to Nashville, you got to have a little in. And I knew uh, Greg Galbraith, who was a guitar player I knew, who played with Bill Anderson, a, a, a country, yep. legendary country star from, you know, or 70s and the 60s and 70s. Greg, Greg was playing on albums like Travis Tritt and stuff way early on, a lot of other albums. He was a session player. And Paul Franklin, who was playing with Jerry Reed at the time, I think. And I sort of corresponded, made friends with Paul. And I was sending him some uh, some of my material. I was doing some instrumentals, and he was yeah. really digging them, you know. And he would he said he was playing them on the bus for everybody, and they were liking. Yeah. So I thought, oh wow, <laughs> That's all, all those guys are liking my playing. So I mean, at some point, I I made a visit to Nashville and and just got to hang out a little bit. And then I'm on a following visit, not much longer after that. I sort of found myself a little apartment. Yep. And hung out just like you, you know you have to do around here. You got to be here and not just have something happen right away. It's yeah. what they call pay your dues. Yeah, you do a lot of hanging around, and uh, so I got a gig at the Stagecoach Lounge that they plugged me into, which was a fun band. You know, everybody was Paul Cook was a drummer uh, who played with Jerry Reed, and yeah. he played there. And it was a, so the musicians would come out and listen to us play. The musicians. Don Kelly band. Yeah. Uh, it was the original Don Kelly band when it all started. I, I played in that band. I, uh, he hired me. Yeah. And it kind of parlayed into other things. Yeah. <laughs> at that point. So did you always did you knew from the get go when you started playing that you that was the what you wanted to do with the sessions or? Uh, no, I, I just it wasn't really that I was honed in on sessions. I, I just wanted to be in the music business. I, yeah. I thought I wanted to play and. Uh, I, I was just more of a jam session guy, you know. I wanted. To, I thought everybody. I was listening to kind of more obscure albums like uh, Buddy Emmons and stuff, yeah. steel guitarist. Yeah. I was. I was into Buddy Emmons and steel guitar licks and he, his jazz style. Yeah. On steel, which not many, you know, start from that or or think about that when they come to Nashville. They're thinking, I want to play with, uh, you know, George Jones or something like yeah. that. But I was more of a fan of the musicians when I look at credits on the back of records, like Larry London and David Hungate and all that. They're, those were the stars to me. Yeah. Because I knew who was playing on the, they indicated who was playing on the records, yeah. you know, on the back, on the credits. So I was a fan of that. And I, I thought, wow, I'd be cool to be a part of that and of that album and, and have your name on a Yeah. Listed on, as credits on on a great album. So was that all also when you started playing? Was that the stuff you were listening to, or? Oh, I start. I listened. Well, I originally listened to Jerry Reed. You know, yeah. uh, I listened to my dad played a Merle Travis thumb. Oh, style. That's... You know, and he showed me that. That's why I had a thumb pick and started there. And then Chet Atkins, he listened to, and he was a he was a finger style picker. Yeah, but he but he was a country singer. He sang Merle Haggard songs. He originally started singing uh, Hank Williams songs. He was a Hank Williams fan, and Ernest Tubb, and then uh, Merle Haggard. And yeah. A lot, of the, a lot of George Jones, all those people. So, that, you know, I grew up in a country music scenario. Uh, but I listened to Jerry Reed. I, I kind of discovered Jerry Reed through him. He had brought home a Jerry Reed album. And then after I got to playing guitar, and I started listening to, you know, what everybody else listens to, you know. <laughs> Jimi Hendrix and Jeff Beck and even jazz, Pat Martino, George Benson, yeah. all those guys. I, I, I was just sort of a school of everything, and which in a way, I mean, uh, ironically, it was gearing me up to be a session player because I, you know, I was turned into a chameleon. You yeah, know, I, I knew all these styles yeah. and I absorbed it all. So, and I ends up, I, you know, I have to I walk in and play on different things, and it sounds like I've been playing on it. For, All my life, yeah. you know, and I, that's what I do every night. So, you know, it sort of got to be a challenge and an art to me to 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 fit into the to, to be a chameleon and yeah. try to figure out what sound goes with that artist. Yeah. So, you know, speaking of sound, do you find that you know, obviously, this being a you know, 
us making pedals and stuff like that, do you find in terms of gear that you have to have special things in order to, you know, survive any kind of session? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, I never could have considered myself much of a, uh, a broad effect person, you know, but, you know, other than when I started, I had a crybaby wah and, mm. a, and a phase shifter and a, and a distortion pedal or two. And, you know, when the country music was starting out, they had cl real clean, pristine sounds, yeah. but they had sustain and I always wondered what what is causing how, how do they get that sustain their yeah. amps aren't driving you know like yeah. Reggie Young and all those guys they had these uh, compressors you yeah know, that they used and Dynacomps or what have you and and uh, later on a lot of different brand names of compressors yeah. came out so I found out that was what Jerry Reed and those guys were getting that funky yeah that kind of quaggy yeah, quaggy that, thing they pop they had the compressors so they could squeeze them and get the funky sound yeah. That was more of in the country genre, and uh, so, but as I got on to playing sessions, you know, it was, it, it kind of, effects kind of opened up your, branched out your idea uh, realm a little bit. Yeah. What about amps and guitars? Do you have to bring a lot, or? Yeah, you got to bring a lot of different guitars. I mean, you know, here's, you know, your arsenal might be a Gretsch guitar with a Bigsby, uh, a Les Paul uh, 335 on the on the Gibson side, Fenders of uh, you know, Tellys of yeah. course, and Strats and uh, um, different just baritones, whatever kind of baritone you use, uh, twelve string guitars. Yeah, you know, yeah, so you gotta what? have different different because you never know what you have to pull out in Nashville. You really don't know what you're getting into till you get there. On a session, nobody. There's no preliminary stuff. Okay, you just come. Sometimes in. they'll send you. Here's what we're going to do, or send you a, a little notification of what to expect. But usually, it's not. <laughs> Mainly, all uh, I'd say about 85 percent of the sessions was we never knew what was going. Oh. You know, we might have a general idea of what the artist was doing, but but not what the material was going to be till we got there. So, do you find it has it changed? You know what's required in terms of, you know, playing this, do you have to change your style, you know, over the years? Oh, yeah, you definitely have to conform to whatever's going mm. on, you know. I mean, it's it's more, music's more manipulated now, you know, and mm. it's, uh, I mean, what, uh, just, when I started out playing, let's just say, with sessions, I brought in an amp like that Proverb sitting there, you know, and they, that they were just going through that totally DI direct thing. Yeah. You know, a lot of people, like the Jimmy Bowen, who was running MCA Records, had everybody running direct. Even the, you know, Reggie Young and those guys had to run direct. Oh. And, you know, they weren't using amps and anything. Everything was totally direct. Oh, wow. And, you know, a lot of them didn't like it because it, their eyeballs would be popping out trying to get it, <laughs> get all these amp emulators going to oh. make it sound like it was an amp. You know, it was, it was, it was a pretty <laughs> laborious thing to try to get it. And I even had to deal with that a little bit. But when I first came in and we started doing sort of a roadhouse music, like Alan Jackson, Brooks and Dunn, we were bringing in smoky amplifiers we had at the club, you know, and they were buzzing and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the engineers would go, yeah, that's, uh, that's cool, but that has, we have a buzz. And I, I went, yeah? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's Fender Amp. And he goes, well, we don't like the buzz. And I thought, which really threw me off because I used to think when I got records and I heard a little buzz at the end of a song or something, I thought, wow, that is so yeah. cool. I'm really getting my money's worth when I'm buying yeah. it. I'm hearing the reality of it. Yeah. They didn't like that. They had to have it all, unless, well, not a bad, I'm not talking about a bad patch cable or something. No, I'm no. talking about the amp. Yeah. I thought it was a little cool and a buzz, but yeah. you know, evidently not. Getting a little bit of a light So vibe. that's when it got into, you know, about, you know, having pristine clear stuff when you go in the studio. But but we still did it. We got away with doing like Brooks and Dunn Roadhouse music. We brought in Fender amps and captured the rooms, yeah. the air of the room around it with the miking, you yeah. know, and it got back. Well, they were doing it on the West Coast, you know, like Dwight Yoakam and Peter Anderson. They were doing it on the West Coast. And yeah. I thought that was very cool. I thought they had some of the best records at the time, Dwight Yoakam and everybody kind of yeah. brought back the old West Coast sound. It yeah. was, you know. I have to give him credit for that with Pete Pete Anderson. Yeah, yeah, great guitarist. So yeah, it was and, you know things change a lot, but we we kind of brought that live amps back in. I don't want to take total credit for <laughs> it, but you know it was part of it. So 
So what about uh, do you have any plans for new solo albums or anything like that? Well, I've been I've been trying to think about a solo album now, but you know, I mean, the always every what what kind of hung me up on doing a solo album was I was busy all the time playing on everybody else's record, and I'm going sometimes I'll go, what is it I play? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who am I? I'm I'm such a chameleon sometimes, you know, and then uh, or all the time, but. I think now I got more. I have more time to really do a, a record now. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm doing sessions, but nobody's just like packing them in like they used to be. No. There's more. It's broadened out. I mean, there's more people doing sessions and yeah. less sessions, and and you know more of groups coming in or with with the technology of recording, everybody's doing. You know, they can do their records at home yeah. and work on them there and get them sound. So you know, I'm I'm I'm, I'm planning on doing one. Yes. Yeah. And have, it, it will be very soon. Oh. Well, looking forward to it for sure. Thanks so much <laughs> Thanks, for, for taking the time. You're welcome. Glad to work with you guys. You got great, great pedals. Thank I'm you. Just, just really excited about all the stuff you guys got. I'm, I'm uh, into it. But Thanks. it's good talking with you, yeah. man. <laughs> cool.